Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Mankato, where our worship is entirely real and vital, life-giving and life-sustaining in all times, including these times. Everyone here today in person or through Zoom, you are all welcome in this time that we make sacred together. All are loved, worthy, and needed. Here, you can bring your whole self. In these times and all times, may we move into action to create the world of equity and liberation about which we dream. May we hold reverently and tenderly to this one life, the here and now of which we are certain. We humbly acknowledge that before European colonization, the Dakota peoples were stewards of the land on which our, field, our fellowship building exists. They teach us that the land does not belong to any of us, though it holds the history of our conflicts and reconciliation attempts. We commit to an ongoing and intentional journey of humble connection with indigenous peoples, characterized by understanding our shared history, accepting responsibility for restoration, and building relationship in the here and now. Thus, we seek to be good relatives. I am Susan Stevens Chambers. I'm serving as worship associate today. Sunday morning is a team effort. Thanks to greeters Ken Davies and Kathy Fushi, and thanks to our tech squad, Andy Roberts, and worship tech, Kat Clements, and to hearing assist, Dennis Cramblett, and we're grateful to Nancy Cramblett for offering us live music this morning. We're also very grateful to continue our offering of children's programming and thankful for the staff and volunteers that make these programs possible. Our child care providers, Carrie Johnson and Julia Hammond, are already in the nursery. And Danielle will be joining our director of children's faith development, Macy Forsyth, later for Children's Chapel and working also with the youth. If you're new to the fellowship, we're grateful you are expanding the we who is us. And we're grateful to have contact information if you would like to share it. There's an online form as well as physical forms in the pews and in the entryway. And we have hospitality again today in the fellowship hall. It looks delicious. Thanks to Nancy Blethen and Sue Wilchin. So come and join us afterwards. And just a reminder that the new pew card with QR codes will, with the help of your smartphone, lead you to the order of service for today and the orders of service from past, where you'll find links to music, readings, and stories. There are codes also to make a donation or to fill out a pledge form for those of you who are interested. Just a reminder that the Green Sanctuary team is offering a presentation on regenerative agriculture after coffee hour today in the sanctuary. And on Wednesday, March 29th at 6 p.m., the Board of Directors will host a conversation on the future of our rental property. Child care is provided for this event. Our guest minister today is Justin Schroeder, a lifelong Unitarian Universalist. He's worked at the Unitarian Universalist churches in Fort Collins, Colorado, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and in the Twin Cities. From 2009 to 2021, he served as senior minister and then co-senior minister at First Universalist Church of Minneapolis. After a good goodbye with the congregation, he and his family spent a year living on the road in an RV, traveling the US and in Mexico. He and his family are now settled back in Minneapolis. He and his wife, Juliana, are in the process of launching a business called Holding Space for Change. He has an active daily spiritual practice, which includes meditation, writing, and yoga. Justin enjoys gardening, running, and spending time with his family. 
and we are very glad he is with us today. Welcome, Justin. And now, we ready ourselves for worship. Together, let us kindle a flame symbolizing our co-creation of sacred space at home and in this place made sacred by years of love. As you do, those of you on Zoom, please write in the chat that a chalice is lit near street. And you'll find a card in the pew with the unison words. Please say them with me. We are a welcoming people of diverse beliefs who commit to nourish the spirit, broaden the mind, nurture the earth, and build community. May this flame we kindle remind us to strive today and every day to love beyond belief. First reading is from Christine Kane. Sometimes when you're in a dark place, you think you've been buried, but you've actually been planted. What a fabulous reading of that story. I can't see the screen, but I, can, I could feel you all with the story, and I'm sure there's images that are up there as well. So I want to say thanks to Macy. I invite you into a spirit of contemplation, a spirit of quiet. It goes by many names, prayer, meditation, receptiveness, but I invite you into that place now. Spirit of community in which we share and find strength and common purpose. We turn our minds and hearts toward one another, seeking to bring into our circle of concerns all who need our love and support, those who are ill, those who are in pain, either in body or in spirit, those who are lonely, those who have been wronged. We are part of a web of life that makes us one with all humanity, one with all the universe. We are grateful for the miracle of consciousness that we share, the consciousness that gives us the power to remember, to love, and to care. May it be so, and amen. Our second reading comes from the Reverend Jackie Lewis. I was feeling very low and frankly so weighed down with grief I didn't really know how to move forward. I kept throwing myself into work, running fast to do something about the pain. But ever wise, my friend Lynn said, wait, stay right there. Stay where the pain is, where the suffering is, where the struggle is. Stay there. That's where it's going to come. The insight, the knowing, the wisdom. Right there, Jackie. It's not here yet, but it's coming. And when it comes, 
I'll midwife it with you. It will come. We will do it together. Just wait for it. It will come. Well, good morning, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Mankato. It is really good to be here. I have felt and continue to feel just so warmly welcomed working with Sue and Nancy on the piano and the awesome, I don't know the names of the tech people in the back and the story for all ages this morning. It's really nice to be here. And I also want to issue just a thank you to your minister, Rita, for inviting me to be here and speak this morning in this really beautiful sanctuary. So this morning, I want to talk with you all about change and transition and transformation and what that process often looks like, as well as the vulnerability and the grief that can accompany this process. On the onset, I want to say that we frequently, and I include myself in this, I frequently, we frequently underestimate the amount of time and effort that change and transition require of us. This isn't a perfect example, but here's an illustration of what I mean by that. Just because the calendar says that it is spring, <laughs> officially spring, it doesn't mean that, boom, we've landed in full-blown spring. Yes, the birds are back, the robins are back, the sun is higher in the sky, there's warmer light coming into our homes, and when we walk outside, the breeze isn't as biting, the snow is melting. But if you've lived in Minnesota for any length of time, you know that March, April, and even sometimes May can deliver a wallop of a snowstorm. Winter basically saying, I'm still here. So we still have to find ourselves through this muddy, mucky, sloppy, icy, in-between time. Spring has officially arrived, but we're not there yet. We haven't quite got to the new beginning of spring. With this in mind, I want to lift up the work of the author William Bridges, and many of you probably know of William Bridges in his classic book, Transitions. In that book, he outlines the essential stages of a transition, which I think are very helpful to know. First, he writes, there is an ending, and all that accompanies an ending. And then second, there is this unknown space, this neutral zone, is what he calls it. I think of it as the messy middle, or this in-between time, this mucky, kind of confusing, disorienting, in-between space. And then finally, third, there is a new beginning. One of the key nuggets here is that a transition begins with an ending or a loss. It could be the ending of a job or a meaningful relationship. It could be the loss of a dream or a loved one. There's any number of things that it could be, but it begins, a transition begins with an ending or a loss, and with the natural grief that comes with that. Even a joyful transition, even a transition that you might celebrate, like the birth of a child or a marriage, it can have elements of grief woven in there because there is an ending to the kind of life that you have known and the freedom, perhaps, that you have known as you cross this threshold into becoming a parent or committed to another person through a covenant. An ending forces us off of the familiar path that we've been traveling. An ending pushes us into that second stage, the neutral zone, that unknown, unfamiliar, disorienting space. It's a really vulnerable place to be. Who are we without the job? that defined us, if we've spent years and years building an identity and become very competent in a particular field and all of a sudden we've lost that job that's ended, who are we? Who are we when a 20-year friendship suddenly ends? There's been a rupture in that friendship, an ir irreconcilable sort of difference that has ended that friendship. Who are we then? That middle space is like the goo 
inside a chrysalis. The caterpillar is no more, and the butterfly has yet to emerge. All that's there inside that chrysalis is the goo that used to be the caterpillar, but is not yet the butterfly. Something is happening. Those goo cells, I think scientifically they're called imaginal cells, those goo cells are doing something. Something is happening there. And a butterfly will eventually emerge, but the process can't be rushed. It's helpful to have this basic framework of the ending in this neutral zone, this messy middle, and then the new beginning, because I think over the past three years, all of us have experienced tremendous waves of change and transition and transformation, as well as the more difficult to name grief and vulnerability that has come with that. And on top of that, I know that Reverend Rita has announced she will be resigning her position here in June. It's for a good reason. She's going to be closer to family. You understand it. And yet it is change on top of change. And I imagine brings up a lot of feelings. And it's worth taking a moment to reflect on just how much all of us have gone through in different ways, but it's been a collective experience since March of 2020. Overnight, when you think back, life got turned upside down and backwards. Spare rooms and closets were turned into workspaces in our homes. You lost a job, perhaps suddenly, or your position changed, or if you were a frontline worker, your life suddenly became incredibly intense and overwhelming, perhaps. Lockdown forced all education to go online. Our churches closed and everything became virtual. Trips and graduations, weddings and anniversaries, all of those things were often canceled or postponed. And at first, these changes put many of us just into a basic sort of survival mode. You know, if you're a parent with young kids, you're like, how do I manage to do parenting and education and maybe work all at home and like navigating all of these things. But then after we moved out of that basic survival mode, it wasn't long before many of us began to re-examine and question our priorities, our work, the institutions we were a part of, really to take a hard look at everything, every part of our life. And this is what happened to me. This is what happened to me during the pandemic during those early days of lockdown. So I should tell you, I'm a lifelong Unitarian Universalist, and I've served a number of congregations over the years. And most recently, I was senior minister and then co-senior minister at First Universalist Church in Minneapolis. And in Unitarian Universalism, it is not uncommon for ministers to take a sabbatical time, this time of rest and renewal and spiritual deepening and reflection. And after nearly 10 years of serving First Universalist Church, I had five months of sabbatical time set to begin in New Zealand in January of 2020 with my wife and with our two boys. While we were there, the pandemic hit. And there was this moment of wondering, should I just bail on this sabbatical and come back to Minneapolis and serve this congregation? But I talked with my co-senior minister and the leadership of the church, and we agreed that I would continue sabbatical time with my family. The church was in good hands with leadership and my, my co-senior minister. During that pandemic lockdown in New Zealand, some things began to get unlocked in me as I started to reevaluate my priorities. New doors started, open, started to open up in my imagination, in my heart, and I began to see and to sense that there was a different life in me that wanted to be lived. A life that wasn't about full-time ministry. Those were the early sort of whispers in my spirit. Even though I loved ministry and I couldn't imagine doing anything besides full-time ministry. When I returned from sabbatical, I met with my spiritual director to discern whether or not to stay at First Universalist. After a number of meetings with her, two things became clear. I, I felt deeply certain that I had done the ministry I was called to do at First Universalist. And more importantly, I wanted to spend more time with my family, and particularly our two boys. So in February of 2021, I announced that I would be resigning my position that June. 
And together, the congregation and I, we said a good goodbye to one another. Even though it was the right decision for me to leave the congregation, there was grief at the ending. Grief in having the last sermon that I preach be from my basement office downstairs in our home rather than in person. I think that's why I was feeling actually emotional this morning, just be sitting here and hearing Nancy play and singing with all of you. It's like there's something about the being together that is irreplaceable. So grief is a very real part of that ending in my life, as it is in many of our endings. And then, after I'd already made this choice to leave ministry, and we decided to really double down on endings, my wife left her job, we bought a used RV, as you heard earlier, and we rented out our home, and we set out for the West Coast. This was a massive amount of change in our lives. And let me say this, conceptually, traveling around the country was a great idea. But there was a pretty significant gap between the idea and the actual reality of being on the road. And the first few months were extraordinarily challenging. There were some great moments, absolutely, in those early days. But there were some really hard periods of time There isn't a lot of space in a 30-foot RV, and our kids were constantly fighting. Plus, the humid months that we had spent in Washington and Oregon and Northern California, those were wet and humid months, which caused some funky mold thing to kind of, just a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit of like mold sort of growing around the windows in the RV. So let me say that the Instagram reels and the TikToks that show smiling, happy families on the road in their RVs, they completely miss the more challenging realities of the gray and black water tanks, of roofs that leak, and other mechanical problems that come up on the road. But we hung in there. We hung in there, and in the dry heat of Southern California and Arizona, we cleared out that moldy funk and kind of the psychic funk we had, and we began to truly embrace this time and experience. Though we weren't working during this time, we weren't earning an income during this time, but in fact, we were spending down sort of decades of savings, we were doing very intense inner work during this time. We were writing, and we were dreaming, and we were talking about what might be next in our lives. We were learning to be an unhurried and unrushed time, with our children and with each other. And that was an extraordinary gift to be an unhurried and unrushed time. This time on the road was both invigorating and life-giving, as well as deeply unsettling and vulnerable. We often wondered about the wisdom of this decision to be on the road. We thought, oh my gosh, like what have we done with our careers and what are we doing from a financial standpoint, taking this time to just travel and be with our family? And I will say that without a daily spiritual practice of journaling and meditating and exercising, this whole journey that we were on, this unhooking from the old life that we had known, it might have completely undone me because it was a tsunami of change and transition. But my daily practices anchored me. So I want to pause for a minute and just acknowledge that you may or may not relate to the particulars of my story. But my guess is that you have, and you are probably in the middle of, your own story of change and transformation. And what I want to highlight is that change and transition and transformation is never as simple or as easy as we want it to be. We do not go right from winter to spring. And sometimes we're 99% sure that we're at the new beginning. We've arrived at spring, and that late last winter snowstorm says, "Mm, not yet. You're not there yet. Here's how that looked in my life. As we neared the end of our year on the road, we mapped out a plan for our new beginning. We'd settle back into Minneapolis. We'd sell the RV. And then my wife, who wanted to focus on her career, would start working again, and I would be a stay-at-home dad, something I had dreamed about for a long time. 
It was the perfect plan, we thought, to complete the transition from our old life to the new life. But the job that my wife thought was a go ended up being a bust, as were several other really exciting possible jobs that ended up being busts. So we admitted to ourselves that we were still in that messy middle place, blah, and dang it, and really, we're still there. But we admitted that to ourselves, and as we settled back into that space, we remembered and we picked up this idea that we had first surfaced during our time on this road, this idea that we had held tenderly and kind of dreamed about together while we were traveling. This idea was to start this practice, this business called Holding Space for Change. And the vision was that we'd work with individuals and groups who were in the midst of change and transition and transformation, much like we'd been through. We'd help them to navigate that space toward a new beginning. We'd be like the outer shell of the chrysalis, making a holding, a space or a container for that work to happen in their lives. And once we picked this idea back up, we couldn't put it down. So we've spent, my wife and I have spent the past few months putting together a website, networking and launching this practice. I think it's a new beginning, but who knows, we might not be done with that messy middle just yet. And again, I want to say to you this morning, you may or may not connect with the particulars of my story. But what I hope you can relate to is that many of us are still in the messy middle right now. And many of our churches and institutions are still in that messy middle place as well. It's true that many things have returned to normal, whatever normal really means. And it's true that in-person church is happening again, but not everyone has come back, and it's not clear if everyone will. Every church I know is asking questions about membership and finances and what the future holds. And on top of that reality, I think that we are all still carrying a great deal of grief and exhaustion, processed and unprocessed, from the past few years because of all the change and transition we've been through. We may w wish we were at a new beginning, but we may still be in that in-between space. Which brings me right to the beautiful story that we heard this morning. The rabbit listened. That story offers a, I think, a powerful roadmap about how we can navigate change, transition, and transformation. And particularly, how we navigate that disorienting place between the end and the new beginning. So I didn't get to see the pictures, but I'm imagining you saw the pictures of the story up on the screen. So in the beginning of that story, Taylor has built this pile of awesome, right? He's stacked the blocks up. He's built this amazing structure. And then that whole pile of awesome is just leveled out of nowhere. That's stage one of the change transition process. That's the ending. Then Taylor is forced into this middle space. And he's there for a long time. This whole parade of animals comes through while he's in that space, offering kind of like, we'll help you fix it. Let's just talk about this. Let's go wreck some other person's or thing. You know, let's just, ah. And Taylor's like, ah, just waiting frustrated, confused, angry. Finally, the rabbit comes along, just sits there, just hangs out, just witnesses, is present to. And in that space, Taylor moves through some of the grief and the rage, the anger, the despair, the disorientation, all of those big feelings that the change has brought about. Like Taylor, many of us and our institutions might be in that in-between space. The story reminds us that when things have been knocked down, when they've been disrupted, when they've been changed, perhaps the best thing we can do is be with one another. We can listen. We can be present. We can invite grief and confusion and wonder, our own and the person or people we're with. We can engage in spiritual practices that ground us 
as everything else around us feels shaky. We can decide not to rush too quickly toward a new beginning or not to rebuild anything too quickly. Instead, we can make the choice to let the time in the messy middle work on us. We can trust that in that space, life, love, and spirit are at work, slowly leading us toward new possibilities, toward a new beginning. Friends, winter never lasts forever. Spring always comes. May it be so, and amen. As we conclude our time of worship this morning, let us make a promise that we will remain committed to sustained and robust community and relationship with each other and to the vision of our faith community, to the values of the Unitarian Universalists, and to the interdependent web holding us all. As Reverend Justin extinguishes the sanctuary chalice, please extinguish your chalice at home and say the words with me, which are on your pew cards. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. <laughs>